Right. Welcome back to the second talk of the morning. It's a pleasure to welcome Aaron Pollock from um, San Diego, and he will uh, explain us the latest news on modular forms on G G2. Hey, uh, thank the you. The board is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak here. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's been a nice workshop so far. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about modular forms of half integral weight on G2. And the main results we'll talk about are joint with Spencer Leslie. So uh, I just want to start off with some uh, a very classical uh, fact, or a few classical facts. And then the main results are supposed to be uh, sort of analogs of these classical facts. So, so uh, to get started, let me write down the classical uh, theta function. So z is in the upper half plane. z is in the upper half plane. And let me sum q to the n squared, where n is an integer. Uh, q, of course, being e to the 2 pi z. And uh, this classical theta function is a modular form of weight one half for a certain congruent subgroup. So theta, uh, so let me write this out one more time. So this is one plus two times the sum of q to the n squared, where n is at least one. So that's its q expansion. And so this is a modular form of weight one half uh, for the congruent subgroup uh, gamma one of four. For gamma one of four, which recall, this is the A, B, C, D in SL2Z, such that uh, A and D are congruent to one mod four, and C is congruent to zero mod four. So this is sort of the simplest modular form of half integral weight. And the next simplest modular form of half integral weight, you can obtain just by cubing this theta function. So consider the cube, theta of z cube, uh, and let's look at its uh, q expansion. So this is sum q to the n1 squared over n1 and z times q to the n2 squared, n2 and z times uh, sum q to the n3 squared, n3 again and z. Uh, so if I expand this out, uh, what's the Fourier coefficient of q to the n, well, it's the number of ways you can write the number n as the sum of three squares. And zero where r3 of n is the number of ordered uh, three tuples, n1, n2, n3, such that the sum of their squares is n. n1, two, n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared is equal to n. OK. Um, so, uh, uh, so Spencer and I call this modular form uh, E sub CZ of Z after Henri Cohen and, and Don Zagier, uh, who studied uh, a, a more complicated uh, but similar uh, modular form. So Cohen uh, in two separate papers studied uh, I'll say analogous or similar modular forms. And now the first uh, surprising fact about the state of Z cubed uh, is that these Fourier coefficients R3 of N are uh, turn out to be uh, very arithmetically interesting. So these are arithmetically interesting in a way that I'll explain right now. Okay, so uh, I want to take a brief, uh, very brief diversion into what are called class groups of number fields. So this is something that um, uh, every number theorist learns in their first course, but uh, on number theory, but, um, but I know, you know, not everyone here is a number theorist. So let me say a word about this. So suppose K is a number field, which means that uh, K is a field uh, containing the rational numbers. And as a Q vector space, it's finite dimensional. And finite dimensional as a Q vector space. That's the definition of a number field. Then inside of K, 
you can construct what's called the ring of integers. So o, commonly denoted OK. And this is uh, a certain lattice inside K. And it's the, um, the analog of the integers inside Q. So this is, by definition, the alpha and K that satisfy a monic integral polynomial uh, over the integers, such that there exists uh, F of T and Z adjoint T monic, such that um, F of alpha is equal to zero. And a natural question to ask is, does this ring, uh, okay, so this is a ring, and it's also a lattice inside K, so this is a ring, and it's also a lattice in K. And a natural question to ask is, uh, does it have unique factorization to primes? And so this question is in some sense answered by, by this, uh, this object called the class group. So there exists um, a finite abelian group. This is a theorem, a finite abelian group uh, denoted class of K called the class group K. Class group of K with the property that it's trivial uh, precisely when this ring OK uh, has unique factorization. Property that the class group of K is the trivial group precisely if uh, OK has unique factorization into primes. OK. So that's my um, diversion into class groups. And so now I can come back to these R3 events and tell you the following uh, sort of old theorem of Gauss. So, so theorem, and this uh, essentially goes back to Gauss. Suppose n is at least four and it's square free, square free, meaning it's not divisible by the square of an integer, and it's congruent to one or two mod four. So then uh, this number, R3 of n, the way, number of ways you can write n is the sum of three squares, is equal to 12 times the class group of the field q adjoined square root minus n. Okay, so Gauss um, didn't have groups. Uh, he certainly didn't have number fields or class groups, but he had um, binary quadratic forms. And there's a way of understanding class groups of these quadratic fields in terms of binary quadratic forms. And that's what, what Gauss had. Okay. So the corollary of the above discussion is that the Fourier coefficients of this theta sub CZ which is theta of z cubed, this modular form of weight three halves. You can think of them as counting the class numbers, these, uh, these class groups, the class numbers of the fields um, q joint square root minus n. Sorry, this this equation is that the question you're asking? Me? Yeah, what's CL? Oh, so CL. Oh, sorry, I meant to put the size of CL. Um, so, so CL is a finite abelian group, and yeah, I meant to write the size. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, what I'm going to do is. Uh, tell you a, a very rough version of, of our main result and I'll put it on this board and I'll try to remember uh, not to erase it. Um, so theorem, I'll move the board up once I've finished writing. So this is again, joint with Spencer Leslie. Uh, so there's a mul multiple parts here. So the first is um, there exists a notion of half integral weight modular forms. Uh, and I'll even say 
what are they're called quaternionic modular forms, quaternionic modular forms on G2, the exceptional group, split exceptional group G2. Um, these mod quaternionic modular forms, they have a, a sort of a classical Fourier expansion and Fourier coefficients. And the Fourier coefficients Um, the modular forms, let me call them phi. The Fourier coefficients of quaternionic modular form phi uh, are indexed by. So, if you have a classical holomorphic modular form, its Fourier coefficients are indexed by the non negative integers. Those are the parameters uh, that varies as the, the Fourier coefficients vary. So, what are they indexed by on G2? So, they're indexed by uh, binary quadratic. Binary cubic forms indexed by uh, binary uh, integral binary cubic forms So those are um, polynomials, cubic polynomials, P of u v, which are of the form a u cubed plus b u squared v plus c u v squared plus d v cubed with the coefficients a, b, c, d integers. Uh, so this is the index set. And I can sort of tell you uh, what several of the Fourier coefficients of a certain modular form of weight one half on G2 are. That's sort of supposed to be analogous to uh, this corollary. Okay, so there exists uh, theta G2, a weight one half modular form, quaternionic uh, modular form, uh, some particular level, which I'll just write as gamma one G2 four, which it's some sort of subgroup that's similar to this gamma one of four, um, such that the Fourier coefficients are as follows. Uh, the Fourier coefficients, A phi of P are as follows. So we don't know all of the Fourier coefficients, but we know uh, a lot of them. And the ones we know are when in this binary cubic P, the last term D is equal to one. Those are the ones that we can uh, say what they are. So suppose, P of U V has D equal to one. Uh, set R to be the ring Z adjoin T mod uh, the cubic P of um, one T. So that's a monic cubic. So this is some uh, uh, free Z module of rank. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of details that I I'm not going to necessarily go into just for the sake of time. But if you know more about G2, these um, it has a Heisenberg parabolic, and these four coefficients are uh, abelian four coefficients along the Heisenberg parabolic, the uniform radical of the Heisenberg parabolic. Okay. Uh, so set R to be this ring, and E to be uh, R tensor Q. And there's a few different cases. Um, so the easiest case, so if E tensor over Q with the real numbers, so this is some rank three um, R algebra. So there's two possibilities. It could be R times R times R, or there's more than two possibilities, but um, two particular possibilities are R times R times R or R times C. So if this is in the case where you get R times C, then the Fourier coefficient is zero. So that's not interesting. Um, or depending on your perspective, maybe it's interesting, but um, not saying much there. Uh, the more interesting case is when you get R times R times R. If E tensor over Q with R is R cross R cross R, um, 
suppose for simplicity, just for simplicity of exposition for this talk, um, simplicity that uh, this ring R is this maximal order in E. It's the ring of integers in E. So that's a, um, uh, that's a condition on E, a non-trivial condition on E. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily, uh, most, in fact, most uh, such E's do not have uh, a maximal order that can be written in this form. But uh, this is still a large class of, uh, or an interesting class of such, such R. Uh, so then, in this case, the Fourier coefficient, uh, a theta g2 of p, I think I wrote a phi of p here, but this is a special modular form, a theta g2. Uh, then this Fourier coefficient is related to some class numbers. So it turns out to be uh, 48 divided by the size of the number of plus or of, uh, um, let me just define this. So by mu two of r, I mean the, the zeta in r, such that zeta squared is equal to one. So this is usually just of size two, uh, times what's called uh, the narrow class number. Uh, it's two torsion. Uh, so for, for the, uh, the number theorists, let me recall for you that the narrow class group is the one where instead of dividing by principal ideals, you divide by principal ideals with a totally positive generator. And for the physicists, this is just some slight, um, uh, you can just think of it as the class, the, the class group, uh, just slightly different. And I've taken the two torsion here and the size of that group. So this is some power of two and times one more factor, which is actually quite interesting, delta R square, we have to define this. Where uh, delta R square, is either one or zero, and it's one if the inverse different of R is a square in the narrow class group, and it's zero otherwise. Okay. Um, so some of these Fourier coefficients are zero, and uh, some of these Fourier coefficients are like 24 times the power of two. Uh, where the power of two is telling you something about class groups. Okay, uh, can can people see the bottom here, or did I make a mistake? Okay. So, so Please. Uh, Gam, Gross, and Sabin had this class of minimal theta series or some kind of theta series on T two. Yeah. Is, is are those related, or is that? The uh, they're analogs, but they're different. So, if I have time, I'll try to. Uh, clarify that. But so the short answer is that, uh, yeah, let me just tell you the short answer. The short answer is that if you take the minimal guy on E8 yeah. and you restrict it, that's an, uh, a weight four modular form. So it's an inter of integral weight and you restrict it to G2, you get the ones that they studied. And those four coefficients, they count uh, embeddings of like rings, like rings like R like this into like the exceptional cubic Jordan algebra. And here what we've done is instead of taking the minimal guy on E8, we take the minimal guy on the double cover of F4, which is a weight one half modular form, and we pull back to G2, and then we get these class numbers. Yeah. So it's, but, uh, oh, anyway, I'll write some of that on the board maybe if I have time at the end. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, this was the rough version of the main result. And the rest of the talk, what I want to do is just sort of um, ex expand upon the definition of the terms in the theorem. In particular, what I want to do is tell you what these modular forms on G2R and tell you what uh, half interweight modular forms on G2R and tell you what uh, the Fourier expansion is and what the definition of these, or roughly speaking, what the, the Fourier coefficients are. And if I remember, I'll try to keep the theorem on the board and just use these points. Okay. Okay, so to do, um, I want to tell you about integral weight quaternionic modular forms on G2, which is uh, what Daniel was just uh, hinting at. I want to talk, tell you about the half integral weight case. Uh, 
Uh, I want to tell you about the Fourier expansion and the Fourier coefficients. What does that mean? And uh, if time permits at the end, I'll, I want to say, of course, a, a word about the proof. So uh, proof, uh, time permitting. So uh, to motivate the definition of these, um, so in order to tell you about half interweight modular forms in G2, I should of course tell you first about the integral weight story. That's, that's more simple. And then to motivate the integral weight story on G2, it'll help for me to, uh, it'll help me to sort of reformulate the definition of holomorphic modular forms on SL2 first. So I'm first gonna um, just quickly reformulate uh, holomorphic modular forms on SL2 from a, just a sort of a group theoretic perspective. So review of holomorphic modular forms on SL2. Okay, so suppose F uh, is uh, a weight L level gamma holomorphic modular form on SL2. So F is, by definition, a function from the upper half plane to C uh, with some transformation property, with uh, transformation property under gamma. So I'm going to define a new function, which I'll call um, well, first, okay, so first I need one bit of notation. So define uh, J from SL2R across the upper half plane to C as J of the matrix A, B, C, D, comma Z is C, Z plus D. Okay, so this is the familiar factor of automorphy. So now uh, define uh, so given a holomorphic modular form F of weight L and level gamma, define phi sub F, which would be a function from SL2R to the complex numbers as phi sub F of some matrix G to be, well, what I do is I take J of G comma I, I in the upper half plane, raise it to the minus L, where L was again the weight, and I multiply this by F of G applied to I. So G acts on I by fractional linear transformation. So you get something in the upper half plane, you plug it into F and you multiply by this, uh, by this factor. So, um, so from the point of view of automorphic forms, this is a very natural thing to do. Um, so uh, let me just tell you the key properties of this function phi F. So phi F, uh, so zero, phi F is of moderate growth on the group SL2R. Uh, one, it's left invariant by gamma. So phi f is a function from SO2R mod gamma to C. So the transformation property under gamma just becomes uh, trivial. Uh, two, uh, phi f has some, uh, a nice uh, um, uh, translation property under the maximal compact subgroup SO2 of SO2R. So phi f of G K theta is e to the minus i l theta b f of g if k theta is this matrix cosine theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta so this is in the group so2 and then finally uh, there should be some condition that uh, tells you about the holomorphy of the function f and you can express that as um, this function phi f satisfies uh, an equation which I'll write d sub cr of phi f is identically zero, where this is some differential operator that corresponds to the fact that f satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations. So d sub cr, uh, first order linear differential operator, uh, which you can express purely in terms of the group theory of the group SL2R. Okay, and then 
uh, you can go backwards. If you have a function Fs that satisfies the properties, you can just reverse this construction and get uh, a whole morphic modular form uh, of weight L and level gamma on the group SL2. Okay, so the point of uh, writing that out was so that I could now write out the definition of uh, integral weight quaternionic modular forms in G2 in a way that looks uh, very analogous or very similar. So uh, let me start with some notation. So G2 of R, this is a non-compact uh, simple Lie group of dimension 14, a particular one. Um, and inside of it is a maximal compact subgroup K, which looks like uh, basically a product of two SU2s. So this is SU2, which I'll, I'll give one S22 a copy, uh, a subscript of L, which I'll explain in a second. Another S22 a copy, uh, or subscript of S. S22, uh, mod a diagonal mu2, which is important for us. So mu2 means plus or minus one. Uh, it's embedded diagonally here. Uh, so this first copy of S22 is what's called the long root S22, and the second copy is what's called the short root S22, hence the L and S. Uh, so what this means is that um, these two SU2s uh, sort of behave differently inside the group G2 of R. So it's just, you know, uh, if you forget about the G2 of R, then I guess they're the same, but if you're embedded inside G2 of R, they behave differently. And so the long root one, uh, you can distinguish it by saying that if you take the Lie algebra of G2 and you restrict it to the long root SU2, uh, the adjoint representation, this contains uh, the two dimensional representation of SU2 while the short root SU2 uh, does not contain the two-dimensional representation. So that's one way of keeping these straight. Uh, okay, so this K has a certain representation, which I'll call VL, and L is gonna be the weight of some modular form. Uh, so it's a non-negative integer uh, for me, uh, for now. So, um, so L in Z at least one. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, um, the 2 l symmetric power representation of the standard representation of the first copy of SU2, and I'll tensor, tensor, tensor it with the trivial representation of the second copy of SU2, okay? And so I had to take, if I wanted to put uh, the trivial representation on the second copy of SU2, I needed to take an even symmetric power here of the first copy of SU2, so this diagonal mu2 acts trivially, okay? So that's why I've taken, even though I have a 2 l symmetric power here, I've labeled it with an L, because that's, uh, sort of the best um, you could do. Okay. So now I can tell you the definition of quaternionic modular forms of integral weight L, or give you a rough definition. So suppose gamma inside of G2 is a congruent subgroup. A modular form, uh, quaternionic modular form, which I'll abbreviate QMF, Quaternionic modular form on G2, uh, let me call it phi, on G2 of weight L is uh, an automorphic function is phi from G2 of R mod gamma to this representation VL of the maximal compact subgroup uh, such that it satisfies the following properties. Uh, well, first, I want to impose moderate growth. That's important uh, for, for us. Um, v is of moderate growth. Um, second, uh, I want to impose a sort of a K equivariance condition, like this condition over here. So phi of G K is K inverse applied to phi of G for all G in G2 of R and K in the maximum compact subgroup K. Uh, so here K is acting on the value of phi of G inside of VL. And then three or two, uh, I want phi to satisfy a certain particular differential equation, which comes from representation theory. So DL 
a phi is identically zero uh, for a certain, which I, I'm not going to have time to get into during the talk, um, for a certain specific uh, linear differential operator uh, DL, which comes from representation theory. And it's sometimes called the, the Schmidt operator, if you've seen that before. Okay, so this is the definition. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that this definition, so definition is a paraphrase of a definition uh, given by uh, Gangros and Savin uh, many years ago. I forget the year, Gangros and Savin. Uh, and I should also uh, credit Wallach, Nolan Wallach as well. Um, and this is, these modular forms of weight L on G2, they were initially studied by Gangers and Savin and Waller. So I'll just underline them. Okay. And I've been thinking about them a lot the past uh, several years. Um, so maybe the first thing to say is that, uh, I, well, I didn't tell you what the, rep, the differential operator DL is, but like I said, it comes from representation theory. And um, uh, if you sort of know where it comes from, then you know, one knows right away that these things do exist. Um, so maybe, I mean, you might write down a definition like this. You might say, maybe the only such fee is zero, but there are, in fact, uh, these things do exist in abundance. Um, and in particular, there are cusp forms and Eisen's end series and stuff like that. Um, so what I want to do is tell you uh, a theorem about these um, that I proved a few years ago that has to that explains that they have a Fourier expansion, Fourier coefficients. So the theorem So suppose um, gamma for just for simplicity, gamma inside G2 is I'll say sufficiently large. This is just for simplicity of writing this result. Uh, so to be precise, I just mean that uh, gamma contains uh, N of Z, where N is the unipolar radical, the Heisenberg parabolic, um, but never mind that. You can just assume this uh, holds for all gamma. And so fix L at least one. Then there are completely explicit functions, um, which I'll call W L of P from G2 of R to the space VL, where L is the weight uh, and P is uh, a binary cubic form. Um, P, a binary cubic form over the real numbers, such that if phi is uh, weight L uh, quaternionic modular form on G2, then you can expand phi in terms of these special functions W. So this is some sort of Q expansion. Uh, phi of G, and I'll put this in quotes because it's not, it's not literally uh, inequality, um, but um, it's almost inequality. Uh, A phi of P, W L P of G, where P, uh, varies over um, integral binary cubic forms that satisfy some positive uh, definiteness condition. Just like, um, you know, the Q expansion of holomorphic modular forms only has positive Fourier coefficients. There's some subset of these integral binary cu cubic forms which are positive in some sense, and this these fees only have Fourier coefficients corresponding to um, positive binary cubic forms. Uh, with these, where the A phi of P's. That's exactly right. Um, so, uh, so a, let me just finish what I was writing here. So A phi of P and C are the Fourier equations. So yeah, to elaborate on the question, um, so really what's true is that the left-hand side, you, instead of taking phi, you take, um, the, the constant term of phi along 
uh, the center of the uniform radical Heisenberg parabolic, and then you get inequality. Um, well, phi could have a constant term along the uniform radical Heisenberg parabolic. Uh, so if you subtract, so uh, you get phi sub z, so that, co that constant term is equal to the constant term along the uniform radical Heisenberg parabolic plus all these other terms. And maybe the key point, or one of the key points is that uh, it's very, in fact, very easy to prove that if um, phi is determined by this Fourier expansion. So even though it looks like you lose some information by taking this constant term along the center of the Heisenberg parabolic, excuse me, the center of the uniform radical Heisenberg parabolic, in fact, you don't lose any information. So that's why, that's what justifies me putting the equality in quotes. Uh, um, and not because of that. Um, just because it turns out uh, for any automorphic function on G2, if you take the constant term along the center of the uniform radical Heisman parabolic, if that constant term vanishes, then in fact, the automorphic function has to identically vanish. And so that's actually the content of what I was trying to express. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the automorph. Um, so you're saying. Um, so if I understood the question correctly. It was uh, maybe I'm claiming that G two is the analog of S L two. If you're moving from this half into weight like theta of z cubed to g2, but I haven't explained why that's a reasonable analog. Analog of these two conditions, the analog of these conditions, one was not over SL2. So maybe one. Sorry, say again? Here again, this condition one expressing the other one. Oh, sorry, I, mis I misnumbered them. So I should have numbered them. I should have called this two. I should have called that two and this uh, three. And now they're analogous. Yeah, so, so if you look at them, that's SO2 on the left. Uh, on the, okay, so, um, so on the left, uh, this is SO2 exactly, which is the maximal compact subgroup of SO2R. Um, in the G2 case, uh, I have the maximal compact subgroup of G2R. Oh, okay. So the analog is that they're both the maximal compact subgroup. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, um, that's right. Yeah, so this is a congruent subgroup. So I'll say contained in G2 of Z, apologize for the small writing um, inside of G2. What's that? Yes, yes, yeah, it's the Chevalier lattice. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, so these four, this, this theorem defines um, the Fourier coefficients of an integral weight um, modular form on G2. And uh, there, it defines them in a purely trans, oh, maybe, sorry, I meant to make a remark. So this theorem uh, sort of extends and refines an earlier result of Nolan Wallach. Let me write that down. Uh, the theorem, so remark, so the theorem, uh, I'll say refines, and earlier result of Nolan Wall. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Uh, oh yeah. So the theorem defines the Fourier coefficients in a very uh, transcendental way. They have no right to sort of be nice numbers uh, connected to arithmetic, but nevertheless, uh, uh, and this is maybe another talk. Nevertheless, they they appear to be very arithmetic. So this is remark one and remark two. Um, the Fourier coefficients appear to be very arithmetic. So, so for example, so I've been trying to give some evidence for this over the last several years. Um, and so one sort of at least conjecture I have is that if you take, say, a Heck eigenform, uh, phi, cuspidal Heck eigenform, then all these Fourier coefficients are algebraic. So that's sort of a sense in which you can imagine these Fourier coefficients are algebraic, are sort of very arithmetic numbers. Okay. So, um, so now I want to say, so I've said what integral weight modular forms are, and I've said what um, the Fourier expansion is. So now 
you can maybe imagine what are supposed to be half interweight modular forms in their Fourier coefficients. Um, but let me you know, spell that out a little bit. So, um, so what are half interweight modular forms? Let's say on G2. Um, so if you know a little uh, about um, the structure of, of Lie groups or um, the real points of algebraic groups, reductive groups, then you know that if I take G2 of R, the split real compact Lie group, it deformation retracts, retracts onto the maximal compact subgroup uh, onto K, which was SU2 times SU2 mod uh, diagonal plus or minus one. And SU2 is simply connected. Um, but uh, once I mod out by this mu2, this group SU2 times SU2 mod mu2 has a double cover. So na namely SU2 times SU2. So let me write K tilde for the double cover of this group SU2 times SU2. Okay, and so um, because G2 of R deformation retracts onto K and K is a double cover, that means G2 of R has a double cover, which is, uh, which I'll write as G2 tilde. And this contains uh, K tilde. So, um, so I'm just defining G2 tilde to be this double cover. So this is the double cover. So this is a G2 tilde is uh, a nonlinear uh, Lie group. So meaning by nonlinear, I mean it does not have any faithful finite dimensional representations. It doesn't come from an algebraic group. Um, but nevertheless, with some work, you can talk about automorphic functions on it. And so half weight modular forms are going to be automorphic functions on this G2 tilde. Okay, so, um, so let me just tell you a, a little bit about this G2 tilde. So the first thing to say is there's an exact sequence. So it maps to G2 of R that has this covering map. And the kernel is a, a central subgroup of uh, that's equal to plus or minus one. So by mu2, I always mean plus or minus one. Uh, and this is central. Oops. Okay, and um, it has uh, K tilde as its maximal compact subgroup. K tilde uh, as maximal compact. Okay. So, uh, by the way, the reason I've written G2 of R here, but not G2 tilde of R is that uh, the group G2, you can think of as an algebraic group over Q, and you can, then you can take its real points. So this is some algebraic group. But like I said, or said aloud a second ago, this group G2 tilde is not um, the real points of some algebraic group. So that's why I haven't put uh, an R in the, the notation. Okay. Um, so now I can tell you what a half interweight modular form is on G2. So definition. Suppose L is a half integer, a non-negative half integer. So it's one half plus some non-negative integer. And let me let VL be the representation sim to the 2L. So 2L is now an odd integer, C squared, tends to the trivial representation. And this is a representation of K tilde. Okay. Um, another tricky thing, which happens when you go to these double these doubled groups, is that it becomes tricky to uh, say what you mean or to prove the existence of, or that's not true, but it becomes tricky to uh, discuss concretely, let's say, congruent subgroups. Um, so uh, in the following sense, so, so you have this exact sequence, G2 tilde maps to G2 of R. One, now uh, with some central mu2. And let's say I take a congruent subgroup gamma inside of G2 of R. So in order to talk about modular forms, uh, automorphic functions on G2 tilde with respect to some congruent subgroup, I need to suppose the existence of a splitting of this exact sequence. So I'm gonna write this S gamma. So S gamma 
is a group homomorphism from gamma to G2 tilde, says that when you compose with the projection to G2R, you get the identity. So that's this is splitting. Splitting. Uh, and now you can talk about automorphic functions with respect to um, gamma, once you equip gamma with the splitting. So uh, a quaternionic modular form of weight L, which is now a half integer, is a function phi from G2 tilde mod uh, the splitting of gamma to uh, VL, uh, such that, and then the usual conditions. Um, zero, phi has moderate growth. Uh, one, phi of GK is K inverse applied to phi of G for all G and G2 tilde and K and K tilde. And two, some differential equation is satisfied, some particular differential equation, DL of phi is identically zero. Okay. Um, and so let me just say, um, so this is the def this is roughly the definition. I mean, or modulo what the DL is, it's exactly the definition. Um, so theorem, so this is so this is one of the first things that Spencer and I approved, is that these modular forms of half integral weight have a completely analogous Fourier expansion to uh, this result here. So uh, for the sake of uh, time, I guess I won't write everything out, but um, um, I would say uh, there exists a Fourier expansion and Fourier coefficients. So Fe is Fourier expansion, Fc is Fourier coefficients of phi. So uh, weight L quaternionic modular form where L is in ha a half integer, one half plus the non-negative integers. Uh, similar, completely similar to the Fourier expansion above, the Fourier expansion for integral weight modular forms. Uh, there's one sort of technical twist, and that is that instead of having a single function uh, W L of P that appears in the Fourier expansion, in fact, there are sort of two functions that can appear, w, some W L of P and it's negative. Um, uh, form. Um, so the caveat is that the W L P's Instead of having a, a one distinguished function WLP for each L and P, you in this half integral weight case, you in fact get two distinguished functions, um, which I'll just write plus or minus WL of P. And there's sort of no good, I can make this precise maybe after the talk, but there's no good way of distinguishing uh, the plus one from the minus one. So even though the notation sort of suggests that there's a plus one and the minus one, there's just two that are negatives of each other, and there's no good way of distinguishing them, uh, which means that. The Fourier coefficients, um, the a phi of p's, instead of being complex numbers, they're complex numbers up to multiplication by plus or minus one. Okay. Um, and I just realized I made a small error in stating this theorem. So a theta g2 of p, I, what I meant to write is that this is plus or minus this, because uh, it's only defined up to plus or minus anyway. Okay. Uh, so great. Uh, so in the last, uh, I think, five minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about how this result is proved and why, um, or how this this theorem over here is proved, and uh, and why it's sort of completely analogous to the um, theta of z cubed that I started the talk with. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Um, it's just a uh, abuse of language. By a half integral weight modular form on G2, I mean, technically it's a function on the double cover. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, so um, let me say a word about how this theorem is proved. Um, so back to uh, SL2 and theta of Z cubed. So like I said, one way of getting theta of Z cubed is to take theta of Z, this modular form of weight one half and cube it. But there's a set of second way to obtain theta of Z cubed, which is uh, more enlightening from the point of view of this, uh, of the mathematics I'm talking about here. So, so consider uh, theta SP6 of Z, which is a weight one half Z go modular form for SP6 or SP3, depending on your, uh, so genus three, um, depending on your conventions. So which has Fourier expansion, um, sum over V and Z cubed, uh, e to the two pi I uh, V, or something you know as a row vector, V, Z transpose V. And Z is in the so-called Z-goal upper half space of degree three, H3. Um, so this is some sort of holomorphic modular form for the group SP6, and it has weight one half, weight one half. And what you can do is you can con consider, so you have the group SP6, and it has as subgroups uh, SL2 embedded diagonally times uh, the compact group SO3. So SO2 times SO3 sits inside of SP6, and you can take this theta function on SP6 and just restrict it to SO2 um, via this diagram. And then you get, um, so let me leave some space, so theta sp6 of z, of z restricted to SL2 means theta of sp6 of the diagonal matrix z, 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 which is, uh, as you can check in your head very easily, theta of z cubed. So this is another way of getting this function theta of z cubed. And so it turns out, let me go back to this picture, it turns out that the group SP6 sits inside the group F4 uh, as the derived group of the Heisenberg parabolic levy. And then you have a commuting diagram of inclusions. SL2 sits inside of the group G2 as, again, the derived group of the Heisenberg parabolic levy. And then the centralizer is this same group, the compact SO3. So this is how we started the, this project. We sort of looked at this diagram and said, well, if we can take a theta function on F4 and pull it back to G2, we ought to get something uh, interesting that maybe involves class numbers or something, uh, some sort of arithmetically interesting uh, results. Um, so let me just state uh, a couple of theorems uh, that are, I mean, due to other people, so I have a chance to mention their work. So theorem, uh, this is due to Loke and Savin. So first of all, there exists an analog of theta functions on the double cover of F4. That's this result of Loke and Savin. So there exists, uh, I'll put it in quotes, a theta function on the double cover of F4 with uh, certain representation theoretic properties with certain, so they construct uh, a, an automorphic representation on this double cover with certain um, representation theoretic properties. Uh, and then this function was further studied by David Ginsburg. Uh, David Ginsburg. Oh, and I should mention this, uh, the construction of this theta, uh, this automorphic theta module on F4 double covers. So this is sort of a generalization of uh, earlier work of Kajan and Patterson. Um, and there's a theorem due to David Ginsburg that um, for this particular automorphic representation, uh, many sort of generalized Fourier coefficients of these thetas are zero. So that's the sort of a sense in which it's a theta function, many four equations are zero. And then, so you might wonder, I mean, so, so what's the hard part and what we do? So a lot of the hard part, and this will be the last thing I, I read on the board, um, a lot of the hard part of what we do is showing that we can take one of these theta functions um, on the double cover of F4 and get it to have um, a lot of nice properties simultaneously. So um, from the construction of Loke-Savin and the work of Ginsburg, uh, they don't give you just like a, 
a Fourier expansion like this theta sp6 of z that, that you have in the class little case. Instead, you have to, to work quite hard. Um, so theorem, uh, check my Spencer. So there exists a special, so both um, Loke Savin and Ginsburg, they consider uh, you know, an infinite dimensional space of these thetas, um, a whole representation, but there exists a special function in this representation, theta f4, on the, F, on the double cover of F4 that has three properties simultaneously, such that theta F4 is a quaternionic modular form of weight one half. So that's saying something special is happening at the Archimedean place, some differential equation is satisfied. Um, theta F4 has some large level structure, has uh, some sort of gamma one F4 of four level. So it's invariant. So in the automorphic picture, it's invariant by some large open compact subgroup. Uh, and finally, the first Fourier coefficient, I'll put that in quotes, the first Fourier coefficient of theta F4 uh, is equal to one. So sort of controlling all three properties simultaneously is maybe half the battle in, in, the, uh, in this result. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you, Aaron, for this um, brilliant talk. Are there any other questions? Of course, we had quite a few. The, the theta function of F4 you start with, is it very small or it's a generic uh, quaternionic modular form uh, in terms of representation? Does it satisfy other equation or is? Uh, so it's, the answer to both questions is yes. So both it's small, it's in the minimal representation, but it's also uh, a quaternionic modular form it satisfies it yeah, yeah but it's not equation. generic it's, a, it's yeah, a, yeah it's a very small yes position. yes thank you um, maybe then i can ask the question so um of course here you use the uh, minimum the representation for f4 um across uh, gan and um and saving used uh, e8 yeah so what other alternatives are there maybe? Do we have another way of constructing potentially other forms? Yeah, so, um, so just to repeat the question to make sure I understand it correctly. Uh, sort of maybe where are the minimal representations on the exceptional group supposed to live? Um, uh, at least in these so-called quaternionic groups. So, um, so you have spin eight, which is sit inside of F4, or sit inside of, all right, E64, which sits inside of, so this is some real form uh, of rank four of the group E6, which is determined by a quadratic imaginary extension of Q, quadratic imaginary, I'll put a K in the notation, quadratic imaginary, uh, which then sits inside of uh, E74, B, where B is a, over Q is a quaternion algebra, uh, ramified, at the Archimedean place. And this is some rank four real form of the group E7, which then sits inside of uh, E84, which is defined in terms of the octonians. And there's only one of those, so I don't have to put in the notation. And uh, so these are the, um, the quaternionic groups. And I guess I can also put split G2 here. And so there's a notion of quaternionic modular forms uh, on all of these quater quaternionic groups. And I mean, we define and prove results about Fourier expansions on, on all of them, but I just sort of state the results in G2. And the minimal representation on all these groups is a quaternionic modular form. And here, um, so the minimal representation, so the minimal representation uh, doesn't exist on G2. Uh, well, it's spherical on D4, which is by my definition, not a quaternionic modular form. So I'll put an X there. Uh, but then on F4, uh, it's of weight one half. On this E6, it's of weight one. On E7, it's of weight two. And on E8, it's of weight four. Um, so there are other possibilities, uh, you know, you could take the minimal representation on E7 and restrict it to some smaller groups and maybe get interesting, interesting things. Thanks a lot for this great talk. So uh, maybe an obvious question, but uh, have you thought of next to minimal representations on G2? I, or? Asked, I asked you that in the debate. That's right. Um, so I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so. So on E8, 4, I, I, 
done some work on the next minimal there. And it's again a quaternionic modular form of weight eight. And I showed that it has rational four coefficients. Um, uh, I thought about restricting it to smaller groups to see if um, one might get something interesting, but some back of the envelope com computation sort of suggests that when you restrict it to smaller groups, you don't necessarily get anything interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you could absolutely discuss next minimal representations on, um, on these other groups. And, uh, but I think not much has been studied about them. Yeah. Maybe a follow-up question. So, so Gan has this paper where he does like a theta lift and lands in uh, an automorphic form generating the quaternionic discrete series. Oh yeah, from uh, from E eight to G two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, could you get one of your G two quaternionic model of forms using theta lifts? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. So, um, so there's a dual pair. I wonder if I still have it on the board. Yeah, up here. So, this restricting the the minimal guy in F four to G two is basically the same thing as taking the integral against the constant function on this compact of SO three. And so, this the theorem is more or less saying something about the Fourier coefficients of that theta lift. Yes. Thanks. Are there any other questions? And, all right. One more, Guillaume. Uh, just naively, E8 is the most complicated of all those groups, whereas it seems that starting from E8, everything has been following. Is it just by accident that the first construction was in E8, or is it really that it's actually simpler to define the in E8? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, that's a yeah, perfect question. So. Uh, from the point of view, so um, so it depends upon your perspective. Uh, so once you, so there's some startup costs to working on the exceptional groups, which is just learning how to compete with the exceptional groups. But once you've paid that startup cost, E8 becomes the simplest one because this group here is split at every finite place. And that's, so, so like the minimal representation is unramified here at every finite place. And so that makes it act, in fact easier. Um, whereas when you try to say work on these other groups here, the groups themselves are ramified at certain finite places and like the minimal representation is going to be much more is going to be more complicated to understand in terms of say Eisenstein series on E74b because of the ramification of the quaternion on B. So you don't have a minimal uh, in the Chevalier subgroup in it congruence. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, great. Um, any question from the web? Doesn't appear to be so. Well, let's thank Aaron again. We have our break now and we will uh, start.